if you're going on a rocket, instead of thinking that you're about to get on some nice safe aircraft, you are going to be told that this has not been certified by the US, US government mm -hmm. is safe. This is the informed consent part of it, okay. where there's all these regulations about what you have to tell the, they're not a passenger, they are a space flight participant, because they are assuming a certain amount of risk too. Time for another episode of the Cold Star Project, the podcast about small sats in space. And we're here with a space lawyer today, Laura Montgomery. She's the proprietor of Ground-Based Space Matters. She's an adjunct professor of space law at Catholic University, the Columbia or Columbus School of Law. And uh, has a pretty neat career, 18 years as a senior attorney for the commercial space transportation um, and a former manager of FAA Space Law Branch, which is a great credential to have. So thanks for being here, Laura. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Jason. I've been you looking bet. forward to this. Okay, well, let's jump right into it. Um, let's explain how space law works in the United States for somebody who just fell into this interview. Okay, all right. Well, um, domestically, under American law, you've got a number of governmental space actors. You've got the Department of Defense and NASA, who are, I call them operators, because they go and do space stuff themselves. Then there are three regulatory agencies that oversee commercial activities, including the FAA, for you know, the Federal Aviation Administration, which should perhaps change its name to the Federal Aerospace Administration, mm -hmm. but that hasn't happened yet. And um, it regulates the uh, commercial rocket people launch and re-entry, so rockets and capsules, and spaceports, as they're popularly referred to. Then the Federal Communications Commission, if you're a small sat guy, you know that it licenses and regulates the satellite industry from the very small to the very large geostationary orbit. And lastly, there's the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and it regulates remote sensing satellites you know, the ones that take pictures of the earth and then sell them to other people. So, so that's sort of the, the basic landscape. And then one of the things to understand about space law is that it's sort of about, it's, it's about geography. So there's a whole lot of other space issues, go, government contracts, um, private contracts, torts, et cetera, that come under the heading of space law only because they involve space actors. Okay. Well, that's a great summary, and I'm sure a lot of people don't know about NOAA. That seems to be the... the Sometimes least. people are surprised. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Didn't know they needed a license to take pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, well, let's, let's jump into your FAA experience. How did that build and impact your approach to space law? Well, so the FAA is a regulatory agency. So, um, you know, again, I, like I said earlier, space law is part of a bigger body of law, and in this context, it's part of administrative law. So the Administrative Procedure Act governs all administrative agencies from the Environmental Protection Agency to FERC to FCC, you know, all of them. So I'm really an administrative law person, but with a subspecialty in, in space, I guess, is how you could say it. So, um, so when I look at space law questions, I am looking very much at both whether the government is operating correctly in accordance with the manner Congress has told it to. Congress passes the law, the FAA is supposed to carry it out. So the FAA kind of has this checklist it's supposed to follow. It's also not supposed to go beyond the checklist. So it's not supposed to start regulating satellites. It's got rockets, someone else does satellites. And um, same holds true for these other agencies. So there's issues of governance, there's issues, of course, of regulatory interpretation, which is more the bread and butter of, of my, my day job. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you're looking at regulations, sometimes they're clear and sometimes they're not. And um, even the ones I worked on probably, you know, have certain lack of clarity or a certain lack of foresight. Did we think that there were going to be spaceports at airports? No, we did not. So it makes it it makes it fertile ground for legal work. Right, I, I remember not too long ago when I was starting to look at space law and the outer space treaties, I was surprised at how few things were actually defined in a clear manner. Oh, sure. They, they and, leave a lot of things up in the air. And you know, that's not the worst thing in yeah. a new context mm -hmm. because 
when you're sitting on the ground and trying to think of, of what could happen next, you may not know. So maybe just leave it open and it'll get sorted out later without being uh, overly constrained by people who didn't foresee enough. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these were in the 1960s, so. Right. <laughs> it was absolutely right. brand new. And, and also, yeah, in my thinking since then, over the last few weeks even, I've been considering, okay, if you had really harshly defined or super clearly defined some of these things, that could lead to conflict as opposed to a more mushy interpretive style, right? Uh, where you're well, you know, out. It's, it's always a balancing act mm -hmm. because on the one hand, if you have utter clarity, you have a lot of transparency and it mm -hmm. makes it very easy for people to plan. But sometimes, you know, the only thing worse than ambiguity is clarity. <laughs> and we, uh, because you might wind up with a, a terrible definition. Oh, let's say we call space 60 miles up. Um, hard and fast, that might not work down the road. So, so yeah, we, we like to leave things open until we have to decide them. Mm -hmm. And that does, that does allow greater flexibility for operators, even though they're gnashing their teeth sometimes, that they can't tell what the government wants them to do. So right. the right. balancing act. So your firm is called Ground Base Space Matters. I'm curious how you picked that name. Well, um, it's perhaps not the best name because it's long and apparently hard to pronounce. And I had someone say she started this firm called Grumpy Space Pirates. And I'm thinking <laughs> that would have been a better name. <laughs> but but I, um, when I was working with the engineers, you know, in my decades at the FAA, I, uh, I heard a lot about space-based systems. That's the satellite and ground-based mm -hmm. systems, command and control. And... Um, I always thought of legal work as pretty much ground-based for the foreseeable future. And no one, no one's going to, don't make any lawyer jokes here, but you know, no one's dying to send me into space yet. So um, uh, maybe somebody is, I don't know, but they don't, they haven't ponied up the money. So, so the ground-based element is because, you know, this is law and there's a whole lot of space that is ground-based. There's, there's probably more, more on the ground than in space. Then the, uh, the other thing is, is there's a little pun in there that I really can't resist. And um, matters is a mm -hmm. legal jargon for, you know, a lawyer has several matters, projects. It means projects. But um, so these are ground-based space matters. Also, I'm trying to say that ground-based space does matter mm. as much as the space-based portion. All right. So who's, who's that ideal client for you? Who, who do you wish would just pop out of the woodwork and say, oh, Laura, help me? Well, um, I've got a couple different types of clients, um, launch operators who need help with FAA regulatory compliance. And then occasionally I talk to people who are um, doing more new space stuff hmm. because uh, they worry about the outer space treaties, which I'm you know, able to help them with too. Okay, good stuff. So I, I'm curious here, okay, where you might disagree with other interpreters of space law, uh, like th there's Article 1 versus Article 2 where, where they say, okay, you can't claim sovereignty over this thing, but we didn't say that you couldn't do this, so you can go ahead and do it. Tell us about your interpretation of that. Okay, so um, you're talking about the Outer Space Treaty, mm -hmm. and the Outer Space Treaty is the 1967 agreement between... Um, lots of, of countries in the world, more of whom are now spacefaring. But at the time it was, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union who were, who were driving the need for the creation of this treaty. And one thing that um, is a little bit of a pet peeve, if I may indulge. Mm -hmm. um, indulge away. <laughs> okay, so, so treaties are agreements. They are not constitutions. And a lot of people like to talk of the Outer Space Treaty as a constitution, but it's an agreement. So that, that's a point worth remembering because if you didn't, if it's not written down, it's not part of your agreement. And so you don't need to say that you have given something away that might be hard on your commercial sector. I, I am a you know, pro-commercial activity person because I think that just like the internet really took off after the commercial sector got a hold of it, I think space is going to take off with mm -hmm with private activity as well. And um, 
and I would love to go visit the moon someday myself. I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford it, but it's nice and I could. And um, in the meantime, I'm very scared and not going to do anything too, <laughs> too crazy right yet. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the thing about the Outer Space Treaty that, well, there's many controversial provisions of the Outer Space Treaty as they might or might not apply to the private sector. And the ones you're referencing concern property rights. Mm -hmm. So um, Article 1 says that the uh, exploration and use of outer space is free to all mankind. It's a very long involved sentence with many commas, so that a lot of people have misread it to say that outer space belongs to all mankind. It doesn't say that. It says it's exploration and use is the province, excuse me, of all mankind. And then there's Article 2, which prohibits claims of national sovereignty. And again, we remember this is an agreement. Mm -hmm. So if there's a word in it, then you have to give it meaning. And the word there is national. So you can't have a nation state claiming mm -hmm. like the moon, for instance, but it does not prohibit private claims. So I think that eventually when someone reaches the moon and works some portion of it and uh, spends a lot of time and energy and establishes a permanent presence, all of which are elements of adverse possession, AKA squatters rights, I think we will start recognizing private property rights and that they are not precluded by, by the um, Outer Space Treaty. So that's a, uh, Oh, there's, there's one other little interesting mm -hmm. point that people should consider, though, is that free space, um, as some people call it, you know, outer space positions on orbit, mm -hmm. that's more analogous to the oceans because people can traverse through those, those waters, those voids. But the moon or Mars, that's land. You have landed somewhere. And it is much easier to establish whether you have... Um, got yourself a permanent presence there or not that should be recognized by others. Okay. Uh, hmm. I'm going to have to think some more about that ocean idea too. There's a Michigan lawyer that I follow on YouTube who had a couple of episodes about a guy who illegally put a bridge out uh, on a lake to an island and he owned the island, but the bridge of course gets in the way of anybody who wants to take their boat and, and go through that channel. Right. And Cause there's, uh, yeah. Free passage mm -hmm. is the principle there. Mm -hmm. right. and you don't get to appropriate other people's free passage rights. Right. So. so because he did not make it a pontoon bridge with a section that was removable or just wasn't there and maybe had to row across or something, but he wanted to drive, then uh, that, that was what made it illegal. Hey, this is Jason Canigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory, compliance and gosh the end customer <laughs> who'd have thought about that right so you can sign up for this if you go to coldstartech.com slash msb that's short for make space boring the mission we're on then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted I'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, I'm able to. So those will be some goodies that are in there as well. So if you're interested in that, go to coldstartech.com slash MSB and join us on the mission to make space boring. Now back to the interview. So in your business, you focus on regulatory and treaty issues. Uh, and we've talked just now about some future issues uh, that I think you'd be happy to talk about. <laughs> but for the present day, when, when does a regulatory or treaty article apply? Could you give us an example or two? You don't have to name names, but I'm Oh, curious. sure. Well, um, it's, it's common knowledge in public, so no problem there. But the, um, uh, the regulatory provisions are easy. So, you know, Congress writes the law, and then the FAA and other regulatory agencies, they go write rules to implement the law they were charged with enforcing. And this does help people know what is expected of them, so they're not wandering around in the dark, wondering what 
what the FAA wants before they give them a license. So the FAA said, the congressional statute and then the FAA regulations will say, this applies to US citizens launching uh, rockets anywhere in the world and it applies to anyone of whatever nationality launching in the United States. So that is a statutory provision that the FAA then copies and says, and but then they get more detailed. And if, if you want to launch a rocket from the United States, you, you need to show us that you're going to do so safely. And here are the ways we think you'll be safe. So if you're launching a big old expendable launch vehicle with a high explosive yield, perhaps we would like, we the FAA would like to hear about your destruct system so that if it ever goes off course, we know that you will um, destroy it and it will be blown into smithereens over the ocean as opposed to over land. And so there's all sorts of regulations that tell you how to design and test that destruct system that you will put on your rocket. Okay, so that's how FAA regulates human spaceflight. Um, in, in well, not, no, the, the human spaceflight doesn't have the destruct system. <laughs> uh, I would hope, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, okay, let, then let's ask that question about, about people then, yeah. Oh, sure. So um, it's very interesting because it is such a nascent industry, the space tourism or, or people to mm -hmm. space, um, that when Congress clarified that the FAA did have authority over people on board launch vehicles and reentry vehicles, it said, but you know what? We do not want the heavy hand of government to you know, unduly burden the, the infant industry. So just like aviation got a barnstorming era where it got to try many different things and innovate away, uh, we'd like to let the space industry have that period of time as well. So although it said, yes, the FAA is going to be licensing launches with people on board, it is um, not going to be allowed to issue regulations to protect the people on board. Keep protecting the people on the ground, but, but not the people on board for eight years. And then hmm. that was in 2004, it's been extended several times. So in, if you're going on a rocket, Instead of being told, instead of thinking that you're about to get on some nice, safe air, aircraft, you are going to be told that this has not been certified by the US, US government mm -hmm. as safe. This is the informed consent part of it, okay. where there's all these regulations about what you have to tell the, they're not a passenger, they are a spaceflight participant, because they are assuming a certain amount of risk too. So the... Um, if you're a launch operator, you have to tell your participant that if the government has not certified the vehicle is safe. You have to tell the participant about your own uh, launch record, as well as the launch record of other vehicles like yours. And then, as of 2015, the participant has to sign an agreement that he will not sue you, and that his estate will not sue you um, if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm and he is harmed. Okay, so there's that waiver provision there. There's the informed consent and waiver, and that's all in effect until 2023. Mm -hmm. It's been extended several times, so. Okay, now, this is very interesting. I, I found out too late about uh, air traffic control as a career. I think I would have been pretty good at it, but I still studied up on it, and there are a lot of great- Well, you look good it. with the equipment there, so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I find the audio quality of this thing is really, really good. Um, and so having read through those books, I've seen the history of, of regulation with the um, air, air industry. Right, and yes, there are some parallels today with space. So uh, it was neat that you brought that up. Um, so there's all these commercial players more and more every year getting into the field. Uh, I'm curious what you believe needs to happen to educate them and ensure compliance from them so that we don't get into conflicts. Well, you know, they should hire lawyers, of course. <laughs> but, um, no, so under US law, um, Everyone is, of course, charged with knowing the law and the regulations. And they, um, the government does a good job of publishing its proposed rules. It says, these are the things we're thinking of making you do. What do you think? And there's a big comment period. And then it publishes the final rules. And they're in books. They're online. They are available. And most um, 
most people in regulated industries know, especially if they're in the type of industry that involves high explosive yields like rocket propellants do. So um, you will find that if you talk to any launch operators, any US launch operators, they know that they require um, a license from the FAA. So that's, uh, it's, it's very, very common knowledge in the press, in the industry, et cetera. Um, so for education, I think that it's nice when uh, law schools offer space law as the place I work does mm -hmm. and let young, young lawyers know about the outer space treaties, the different regulatory agencies, um, ITAR and, and other laws that apply to, to private space actors. Okay. There's one final topic here I'd like to get your opinion on. Uh, it's sustainable development of space resources. I've seen some theories where uh, those nations who are exploiting can get out there first and exploit resources. Maybe they should be paying royalties to developing nations who can't get there to try and get some sort of equality. What's your view on, on things like that? Well, I think you're referring to the Moon Treaty, where mm -hmm. which would set up a redistribution system like that, and um, I think I think it's way too soon to talk about mm -hmm. that. I think getting to space is really hard. I was at an asteroid mining conference mm -hmm. last summer, and uh, and they they were very smart. They invited actual real terrestrial miners to mm -hmm. come and offer their insights, and which I think was brilliant because, you know, the space people can get very excited about things and see lots of optimistic hope. But one of these guys stood up and said, you know, you guys want to mine oxygen from the lunar soil and water, and you think you're going to find these platinum group minerals. But, you know, you know what we would call the lunar regolith if it was here on Earth, where it's easier and cheaper to get to? We call it slag. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, that's depressing. <laughs> and so. Um, I think that, you know, before you start talking about taking wealth away from the people who've produced it, hmm. you should probably let them produce it first. And it would be better if they were given an opportunity to do so without losing the incentives, namely the profits, that make it worthwhile investing decades of your life and the intellectual property of your brain before you give it to someone who did not do the work. Good, good. Well, I, I personally agree with that. <laughs> Being a business guy. It, All right. It's a, it's a tricky question. And yeah. I, I understand the, the thought, but it's like science fiction makes us think space is easy. It isn't. Mm -hmm. you well, you know sense. about science fiction because you are a writer. And uh, I, I'm curious about how space law and your experience with it has influenced your fiction writing. Well, I, I do two types of fiction, science fiction. Um, one is pure space adventure, you know, colonization of, of other worlds and what ha happens after, you know, you lose contact with Earth, things like that. But I also write um, what I call my bourgeois legal science fiction, where I don't know why this is, but it, it, all those stories are full of lawyers. There's at least one lawyer in any given short story or novel. And I... I look at the conflicts that you know legal issues can create, and so I um, I, I work them out with, with lawyers. I throw in some adventure and action too, but it's a it's a lot about um, what can what can be done with space law. And those I said in the near future, in the next hundred years or so. Uh, I have one novel about a prize offered to bring down orbital debris, you know. Like, the Spirit of St. Louis or the X Prize, where you offer a lot of money for someone to develop a new technology. So Manx Prize is my um, is my stab at that, and that's a race as to who can who can bring in a big dead satellite first and win fifty million dollars in gold. <laughs> so, that's fun. And then there are of course lots of legal issues as well as engineering issues, and that's where my my job at the FAA really helped because I mm -hmm. knew what I needed to research and how. So. Um, so, right. Yeah, it's always fun to know that this is the correct process. Right. And I also kept clippings of, of dead satellites on orbit now so that I could use mm -hmm. them to... Yeah, this one. Yeah, I'd give them different names. <laughs> but okay. That way I didn't have to do any math. <laughs> okay. And people can get those off Amazon, I guess, if they go 
Yes, okay. yes. Um, they're all, they're all in ebook. The short stories are all just electronic. Um, most of the novels, except for two, are also in print. So. Okay. Laura, uh, if somebody wants to talk with you uh, about ground-based space matters, where should they go? How should they get in touch with you? Well, um, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and my, my blog where I uh, once a week or so post a, a, new, a new discussion of a space law issue or a, a book review of a science fiction novel and so whether it got its space law right um, is called groundbasedspacematters.com. And there's a contact tab there. And also you can search it for whatever interesting questions you have about space law. I talk a lot about property rights, uh, the Outer Space Treaties, FAA regulation, and whether any given regulatory agency is thinking about exceeding its role, the role that Congress gave. All right. My guest today has been space attorney, professor, and science fiction writer, Laura Montgomery. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jason. Jason.